Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming. The sun is out. The weather's turning nice. It's a perfect time to talk about North Korea. Uh, thank you all for joining us. I'm Mike Green. I'm the Senior Vice President for Asia uh, here at CSIS and a professor at Georgetown. Um, today, uh, CSIS hosted um, the 24th uh, annual uh, meeting on the U.S.-Japan alliance with our colleagues from the Japan Institute of International Affairs. Um, this uh, is a regular um, gathering of experts from the U.S. and Japan with government officials, uh, members of Congress and the Diet to sort of take a health check of the alliance. Um, uh, Nogami-san uh, led the Japanese delegation. The good news is uh, the alliance is pretty healthy. Um, uh, the bad news is the, the world out there is not. <laughs> and we have some very practical challenges we have to face together. And one of the toughest ones we discussed in this group that we'll now um, uh, engage on today is what to do about uh, North Korea and all the people who want to talk to North Koreans and uh, the threat we face. I'll introduce the panel in just a moment. I am your designated safety officer. Uh, if we need to evacuate, we go basically out that way and down the stairs and then out and to the right. <clears throat> in theory, we're supposed to gather at National Geographic and make sure everybody made it, but if we ever have this scenario, I suspect most people will just go home <laughs> or go get coffee and I'll get in trouble for not accounting for everyone, but that's my problem. But the main thing is if we have to evacuate for some reason, it's just basically down the stairs that way <clears throat> um, and, out, uh, and out and to the left. Um, we have four, uh, four of us, um, three are experts, <laughs> um, the other three, and uh, let me introduce them. We'll have a short set of opening comments, maybe a little discussion up here at the table and then open it up. And then afterwards we have res refreshments and as with any North Korea discussion, by necessity we have alcohol um, if you're uh, able to join us. So um, we'll hear first from Ambassador Yoshiji Nogami. Uh, who is a president of the Japan Institute for National Affairs, former ambassador to the Court of St. James. A few Americans, that's England, uh, the Great Britain. Um, former vice minister of foreign affairs, a graduate of Tokyo University. <clears throat> Nogami-san was the Sherpa when I was in the White House. He has lots of experience in multilateral diplomacy as well. Then we'll hear from Dr. Jung Park, who is the SK Korea Foundation Chair in Korean Studies and senior fellow, senior fellow at um, Brookings in the Center for East Asian Policy Studies. Uh, Jung focuses on national security in East Asia, particularly North Korea and North Korea's WMD capabilities. She's worked in the CIA um, and the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. She has a PhD from Columbia in US history uh, and a BA from Colgate. And then we'll hear last, uh, I'll go in there somewhere, and then we'll hear from Kotani-san, um, Senior Research Fellow at JIAA. Uh, his research focus is the US-Japan Alliance um, he went to Doshisha and uh, Osaka University. So um, we'll start first with Nogami Sensei and then we'll go to Jung. So, Sensei. Thank you, Mike. Uh, as uh, the, uh, Mike uh, mentioned earlier, the, uh, this is the 24th, we met for the 24th time for this uh, you know, US Japan security. Uh, Seminar. The, uh, this is a sort of uh, alumni meeting of the U.S.-Japan Alliance managers. The, uh, of course, uh, we have discussed not only about North Korea but also more much larger issues such as China, as well as uh, the, the future strategy for free and open Indo-Pacific. Now, on the uh, North Korea. The, uh, someone who is as old as I am has been dealing with this issue since early 90s. I think uh, the North Korean issue has been discussed first by Kim Il-sung, grandfather of a current leader, father Kim Jong-il, and now Kim Jong-un. The, uh, there's a long history behind this, and long history of disappointment, and uh, if I may use the stronger word, no, long history of uh, betrayals. The, uh, the and <clears throat> on the basis of this long history or, or traumatic history, I think uh, people. 
tend to become very, very cautious. And I hope this cautiousness uh, is shared by those who are going to go to Korean Peninsula for the summit meeting. Uh, the, of course, nobody knows when this summit will take place, or some question even whether summit will take place. The, uh, the, but nonetheless, strong sense of caution uh, is required. <clears throat> there are a number of scenarios. The one, one thing that uh, the, uh, Japan is worried about is decoupling. Uh, the, there may be some deal on the long range intercontinental ballistic missile, but no other issues. Uh, so uh, we'll be exposed to a medium and short term range missile anyway, regardless of the, the, this great deal. Uh, that, that is a major concern. <clears throat> the, uh, we have other aspects of a very, very traumatic history uh, between Japan and the DPRK, uh, such as the abductee issues. And uh, North Korea may wish to talk about American hostages, but they will never uh, talk about abductees. And uh, <clears throat> at the, at certain stage of uh, a negotiation, uh, if there is going to be a negotiation, uh, the, they try very hard to bury this abductee issues. And uh, this is uh, not another concern we have. The, uh, I'm not really a pessimist by nature, but uh, when it comes to this issue of uh, uh, DPRK, nuclear the, uh, issue, the, and nuclear and missile, the, uh, uh, the, I think uh, majority of the people who have some experience with this uh, in a long traumatic history tend to become very pessimistic. <clears throat> the, uh, I'm hoping that uh, the uh, during the process leading up to the uh, summit and after the summit, the uh, full and uh, the uh, ample consultation discussions between Japan and the United States will continue. The uh, foreign minister was here last week and uh, prime minister is coming uh, in the uh, second week of uh, April. And uh, I think uh, it is crucial that uh, the, uh, we share fullest information between Japan and the United States. Uh, the, there is a sense of uncertainty amongst the uh, uh, Japanese uh, uh, with respect to the, uh, the direction of the US foreign policy in general. And uh, in particular, the, uh, what is coming out or what is not coming out from the summit, uh, you know, they're, they're very, very uh, uh, concerned. Uh, the, with this uh, very sort of cautious and pessimistic <laughs> tone, I'll give the uh, floor to you, back to you. <clears throat> Thank you, um, Ambassador Nogami. Um, so Ambassador Nogami talked about um, how we've been working on this situation, the North Korea problem, since the 90s. Um, speaking of the 90s, uh, when, uh, when the news reports broke that Kim Jong-un was offering to um, reach out its hand um, to South Korea for it, in, its, in its New Year's speech, I thought, oh, that is so 90s. Um, because this was, and this was, a, this was breaking news because Kim, for the past six plus years, has done nothing of the sort that he's done. Um, but this, but lest people forget, this is part of this 90s, 2000s playbook of um, coercive diplomacy. So it's as, it's as if Kim dusted, you know, went to his library, dusted off his father's playbook, um, blew off the dust, and then decided to go to page 76 and said, you know what, maybe this is time I 
do some outreach. Um, and you know, it, when looking at North Korea's the cycles of North Korea provocations and cycles of North Korea's outreach. Um, North Korea typically goes um, and talks about um, dialogue and engagement when they want to diffuse tension, um, talk about um, reducing sanctions implementation, um, and to boost their prestige. And so, they're, you know, so North Korea seems to be doing all of these things. Um, but I think what's different um, now is that the US playbook is different. Um, North Korea has been looking for a summit with the U.S. president for decades, um, and this is the first time that a U.S. president publicly and openly and repeatedly said, yeah, I'm going to meet with Kim Jong-un. Um, and this without any kind of confirmation from uh, the North Korean regime about whether they actually did make that offer. Um, so I'll leave that out there. Um, so the, the, the Kim Jong-un's playbook is old, um, with, with a new person um, playing it, um, but we also have a new uh, U.S. playbook. So, we, so that sets off this big scramble on, on what to do. Um, the biggest problems I see are now on coordination. It's coordination, coordination, coordination. It's, re it's easier to coordinate on North Korea policy with our allies and partners and other stakeholders when North Korea is being really bad. And North Korea was really bad. Um, last for the past six months. Um, but it gets even more difficult and complicated and needs more finessing um, and subtlety when North Korea is being good, um, relatively speaking, of course. Um, so, and, and that's why you know, I, I was very happy to see that the national security advisors from the US, South Korea, and Japan uh, met recently. Um, and I would hope that as we move forward on the inter-Korean summit and the possible US-North Korea summit, that there's going to be a lot of back and forth with, with everyone, um, especially our partners, um, Japan and South Korea. Um, on, the, on the coordination side, um, I would hope that with the summits um, that in addition to the, the constant dialogue um, and engagement with, with our partners, that we would also figure out what to do if North Korea stays good and when North Korea stays bad or goes back to being bad. Um, one of the things, part of that playbook of North Korea um, has used over the, few, the past few decades is that it tries to drive a wedge among the allies. Um, and, it's e and that's easier to do when it's being good. Um, so how do we talk about um, what would happen? You know, we're going to be talking about things that go boom um, in the summits, probably. Um, but what happens when we're talking about cyber? Are we talking about North Korea threat on the nuclear side? Or are we also going to address some of the conventional and the subconventional things that North Korea can do? And that includes cyber, the robust conventional capabilities that North Korea still has. Um, and this is not just about the ICBMs that the administration is very concerned about, but, um, but I would hope that in these coordination discussions that we're talking about the conventional and the subconventional uh, threat as well. So I'll stop there um, and pass it to Mike. Thank you. Uh, so my task here is to deliver the, the honne of Japan, the real uh, thinking of Japan as a civilian uh, scholar. Um, so the, the DPRK's invitation to the American president was, was not a surprise. You know, they have done so uh, in, in the past. But uh, the surprise was the, the American president accepted. Um, so in, in fact, the Japanese are uh, very much upset by this uh, fact. Um, but at the same time, uh, as uh, the Foreign Minister Kono uh, here uh, um, uh, reaffirmed with the American counterparts that the US, Japan, and also the Korea now uh, still admit, uh, stick to the maximum pressure campaign until DPRK takes a concrete uh, action toward the, the nuclearization. Um, so the, our policy still remains the same, but I think there's, uh, there's an a ex expectation gap uh, among the three countries, uh, US, Japan, ROK. I would say ROK is, I, I wouldn't use the term naive, but uh, positively optimistic, uh, while Americans uh, cautiously I mean, I mean the, this administration is cautiously optimistic, and the Japanese government is cautiously uh, pessimistic. And I think uh, J Japan has every reason to be uh, skeptical about possible uh, summit meeting 
First of all, uh, we have a record of not DPRK's cheating and non-compliance, and also, uh, you know, their missile capabilities uh, is very much uh, advanced today. And, uh, you know, they have an our road mobile uh, launchers, and uh, they have tested uh, missiles in a lofted trajectory, which makes our uh, missile defense interception uh, more difficult. Uh, and, you know, we are playing a different game compared to, uh, say, uh, uh, 10 years ago. You know, previously, our game with DPRK is to, they give up the nuclear program and will provide the assistance. But today, they have the nuclear capabilities and missile capabilities, and I don't think they will give up their current capabilities. What they would offer for negotiation would be their future capabilities, meaning they are seeking, they would seek uh, arms control negotiation with Americans, with the U.S. Uh, and, uh, you, know, the, you know, without, uh, regardless of the result, the, their current capabilities will remain, and they will continue to pose threat uh, over Japan. So this is why I think Japan uh, will continue to be, uh, continue to be skeptical uh, about this uh, recent move. So um, I think we have to, what we have to do uh, over the next couple uh, months is first of all to narrow this expectation gap among the three. Uh, so the coming Japan-US summit meeting here in Washington would be the uh, first step to narrow such a gap. And I think we have to do the same with uh, Koreans. And uh, uh, finally, I, I think that China needs to be uh, on board. Um, you know, China is actually left out uh, throughout this recent move, but uh, uh, they are a very important player. So I, I think we have to uh, find a way how to uh, engage with Chinese into this. And, Hopefully, uh, there will be a Japan-China ROK summit meeting after April or May. Uh, then if uh, this summit meeting can happen in Tokyo, I think that would be uh, one of the first steps to engage uh, Chinese into uh, this uh, effort. Thank you. Thank you um, to all three of you. Those were excellent opening comments. Let me wrap up the presentation phase with some thoughts on where we are and then ask each of you some questions, and then we'll open it up. The, the administration here uh, uh, was rightly alarmed about recent developments um, by North Korea. The Hwasong-15 uh, ballistic missile is a uh, solid uh, road mobile uh, intercontinental ballistic missile and therefore survivable, meaning that uh, it would be difficult uh, for the U.S. to preemptively target this weapon system, which would mean we'd have to rely on deterrence, on, on retaliation. That's new uh, for us in terms of direct blue on red scenarios with North Korea. So the administration is very worried about that. Uh, the, the number of nuclear warheads in North Korea is growing. Uh, a few years ago, we were talking six to 12. Now we're talking dozens. That changes the dynamic in terms of war fighting scenarios, deterrence, and the danger of leakage. And um, the intentions of the regime under Kim Jong-un are not reassuring. Um, he, after all, used a nerve agent uh, in a public space to kill his half-brother in the Kuala Lumpur uh, airport. So for all these reasons, um, and because of the uh, fact that North Korea is on the two-yard line, um, not quite there on deliverable ICBM, the last piece most reports suggest are getting a survivable warhead to come back into the atmosphere and hit a target. Because they're on the two-yard line, the Trump administration has decided they, they have got to stop them, and the president has promised he will stop them. Uh, now, that's a problem because politically, uh, I don't think anyone on this panel thinks we're going to stop them through either diplomacy or war, so the president has created a, a bit of pressure on himself um, to quote unquote solve this now and this enormous sense of urgency, it is dangerous, it is more dangerous, but that sense of urgency has led down two different paths. The first path, which is what we were talking about between August and January, or February or so, was whether or not the United States would use a uh, military attack to stop this program. 
Some people call this preemptive attack. It's not preemptive. Preemptive is war is legal under international law. Uh, this is preventive war, uh, which is what Japan did at Pearl Harbor, which is now considered illegal under international law to declare and conduct a war to stop a country from developing a capability. People can quibble with that in terms of the Security Council sanctions, but it would basically be a, a questionable legal basis for war. It would. Um, uh, result if the North Koreans fired back in tens of thousands of casualties, uh, if they fired back with chemical, biological, or nuclear, and potentially millions, um, that in turn could break our alliances. Um, the advocates of using military force said, well, we've never used, the United States has never used deadly force, lethal force against North Korea into North Korea since 1953, so they need to be shown we have willpower. I mean, the, the problem with that is, of course, then um, we don't know what they'll do because they haven't, we haven't done this since 1953. The people who advocated military force said um, Kim Jong-un is irrational, therefore he, we can't rely on deterrence, we can't let him have these weapons, but they also argued if we do a limited strike, he'll know it's a limited strike and he won't escalate. So there were the, the advocates, and there were advocates in the administration, uh, couldn't hold their argument together, came to a head, in uh, late February, I testified in the SASC, uh, uh, Jung, and many other, virtually every expert on North Korea in some form or another um, pushed back, and I think also the US military probably expressed some concern. So now we've gone to the other extreme, um, not just diplomacy, but a presidential summit, which is fraught with risk for all the reasons you have heard. Uh, I've been doing this North Korea stuff for over two decades. My frustration is that we treat North Korea policy like it's a toggle switch. Um, we're either pressuring them or we're engaging them. And as Jung points out, it's much harder for us to keep a coherent coordination with our allies or even internally when we're toggling into the engagement mode. But we should know by now that uh, this summit and this diplomacy is very unlikely to solve this, that a military attack is very unlikely and would make, could make it worse. So what I want to conclude with is the even more cheery thought that um, we will probably end up in, in a we should end up in a position where we and our allies recognize that we are looking at a containment strategy and a deterrence strategy, and it's, and it's going to be hard, it's going to be ugly, um, and, we're, and we need to be ready for it and prepared for it and not distracted by this summit talk of preventive attack. We need to really get squared away. And what's in it? Well, this is not deterrence as we thought of it with the Soviet Union, because the Soviet Union had a nuclear deterrent to deter our nuclear deterrent, and we needed a nuclear deterrent because they had overwhelming conventional force advantage in Europe. Uh, North Korea is not trying to preserve an empire. North Korea is more akin to a gangster state. It, North Korea wants to use its nuclear weapons capability, I'm quite certain, we can debate this, but I'm quite certain, um, uh, because it has nothing else. And the fear and terror that it can export with nuclear weapons, uh, they will leverage and they will use to get concessions. And that's how they'll survive and that's what it's for. Yes, it's to deter the US from military force. Yes, it's to outshine South Korea. Yes, it's to deter China. But, but it's not just a passive deterrent you put on the shelf to do those things. It's something I believe they will actively use to compensate for their weakness. And to do that, they have to be threatening and dangerous, even if they temporarily make agreements with us. So we need to be prepared with a much more aggressive counterproliferation strategy, uh, interdictions, including maritime interdictions, covert action, uh, using the sanctions framework to actually intercept and crack down. We should have a zero tolerance for proliferation. In my view, uh, we should have used force against Syria just for cooperating with North Korea on chemical weapons recently. We need to have a deterrence policy aimed not only at North Korea, but at anyone who might receive North Korean uh, technology or help. Syria has done this before, we didn't do anything. Israel bombed a reactor in 2007, uh, but Israel did that. Um, the US has got to have a much more uh, robust and frankly aggressive counterproliferation strategy. We need a much more active counterprovocation strategy. After the sinking of the Chun'an and the bombing of Yongpyongdong in 2010, Korean Air Force F-15s were on the tarmac ready to hit back next time. And we, the US and Korea, got together and said, whoa, 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 kach kach shida, we go together, and came up with a joint plan on what we'd do if North Korea did another, another provocation. We, we need to update that. Uh, we need to find ways to include Japan and others because we will see provocations. It could be transfer, it could be cyber, as, as Jung said, it could be in many domains. And we need to be ready and we need to respond decisively. 
Um, and we need um, uh, much more robust defenses from missile defense to more joint exercises with Korea. All of these carry risk. The, the reason we've toggled from pressure back to dialogue is because our democratic societies uh, and Japan and Korea have had difficulty keeping that kind of robust, forward, aggressive position to roll back to contain North Korea. So we toggle over to engagement and we kind of drop the hard stuff that's risky. And what I would argue is we have got to accept a higher level of risk in how we do all these things, interdictions, exercises, missile defense, uh, because if we don't, we'll go back to the same cycle, but the, the larger risk for North Korea is gonna grow exponential. Uh, so a little risk now uh, is worth it. So those would be my comments. Let me ask a few things of the panelists that occurred to me, if I could. I, I wanted to ask um, for the audience, uh, what, and maybe first to, to Jung and then to Nogami-san and Kotani-san, if, 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 um, if you could tell the President of the United States, look out for this. What are the, what are the, watch it, what are the red flags, what are the things President Trump, if he's prepared for, if he is preparing for this, <laughs> should, should look out for? It's kind of the, uh, I mean, frankly, none of us see an upside possibility of an actual breakthrough, so what are the risks that, that you would warn him about? And we'll, we'll go all the way down the line and start with you. Uh, I, I'd say uh, um, Kim can be charming, um, persuasive, um, he can flatter. He knows when to dial it back when necessary. Um, but he also can read the situation um, when it looks right for him to do so. So I think um, my, my concern is that, um, that, that, that Kim will be charming um, and that he would be able to tap into um, the president's inclinations about um, suspicions about um, the alliance issues, or suspicions about, or you know, basically tapping into the the sort of the the America First national security policies, where um, Kim gives him a win, a very very um, public win. Maybe it's the three detainees, um, and. The allies have to go it alone in terms of you know the conventional type things. Um, so um, ju so just because there is engagement doesn't mean that they're going to be good. Uh, they can um, do the North Koreans will um, are likely to conduct additional things that are plausibly deniable, covert, um, to try to test how willing the U.S. is willing is going to go in terms of maintaining dialogue, and also with South Korea too, um, to see how far South Korea is willing to go. So um, I would say that just because you know there's dialogue and engagement, it doesn't mean that we have seen the end of provocative actions. When. Uh I think uh, the Ms. Park was right. Uh, the, uh, they are using uh, old uh, terminology, for instance, uh, the word uh, denuclearization. It's tested. It, uh, it, they, they have been using this word for many, many years in return for the, the easing the tension on the peninsula. That means withdrawal of uh, extended deterrence commitment by the United States to the ROK and Japan. And this is the, uh, this is the most dangerous scenario. And uh, the, uh, the denuclearization in return for the, the, the decrease on, of tension on the peninsula. That's, that's a very tricky concept. That's one thing. And also, the, uh, this may be a sort of tall order, but uh, uh, I think the uh, president and uh, some of his advisors have been very critical of uh, JCPOA, uh, Iran and nuclear agreement. So JCPOA should be the uh, sort of bottom line. Uh, the, any agreement, if there is going to be uh, agreement, has to be something much, much better than JCPOA. It's going to be a very, very tall task. And uh, one major difference is JCPOA was agreed before Iran came up with this nuclear capability. But now Korea, DPRK, has a nuclear capability. How to achieve denuclearization 
when they have a nuke. Uh, so uh, you know this, the uh, denuclearization. The term de denuclearization is a very attractive term, but uh, what does that mean? Uh, you know this is a, this this is a very very tricky concept. Thank you. Actually, I, I have almost nothing to add. But uh, if I uh, can add, it uh, Mr. Trump treats Kim Jong as an equal partner. Uh, and you know he, he has been calling him a little rocket man, but suddenly, if Mr. Trump calls him as a great uh, leader with you know fancy hairstyle, then you know that will just you know further um, endorse Kim Jong Un's uh, legitimacy, and and it will become more difficult to to deal with uh, this this uh, problem, I think. Jung, when you said earlier just now that you were um, concerned that Kim Jong-un might play on Donald Trump's America First agenda, could, could you say more? Did you mean by that that, you know, that at some level Donald Trump may want to get U.S. forces off the peninsula, thinks that South Korea are deadbeat free riders, and that, that it may be something that dramatic? Or how, could you expand yeah, so a bit on that? I, I, the President Trump said this himself, you know, last week um, at, a, at some fundraising event. Um, and... Uh, the president has held these suspicions about alliances and um, for decades. I mean, this is not a new thing. He's also said it um, in his um, during the campaign trail. Um, so I think, you know, Kim sees when I said that Kim is, you know, can be charismatic and, you know, um, can tap into these types of things. Um, that's what the South Korean delegation said that he was, you know, um, that he was making fun of himself. He said, I see what the media is saying about me and laughed about, you know, laughed at himself basically. So he's, you know, so he's not in this cocoon where he doesn't see what the international, what the world is saying about him, about the situation. So he's watching us as much as we're watching him. Um, and what we have is a convergence of a US president who's not anti you know, pulling troops out, right? Or at least has, has made some comments about that. Um, and we have a progressive government in South Korea. Um, and so we have this convergence of factors that are that could be boosting his confidence that maybe he can make a deal with the US president, um, with this particular president. And one of the things that I thought about, about why um, North Korea was doing all of those provocative things, I mean, the, the ICBM test and the sixth and the biggest nuclear test um, last fall was that, and, the, and of course the, the war of words, was that I thought maybe that um, he's doing this now, one, two, um, to show the new uh, president in the U.S. and in South Korea who's boss in the neighborhood, and two, that he was seeking to, that Kim was seeking to do all of these things and to set the bar this high um, so that he can cement those advances for the next three years or the next four years, as the case may be for South Korea. So, um, so it, you know, I, I worry about Kim's confidence. I think dialogue and diplomacy is absolutely critical, um, but I also worry about Kim's confidence in um, thinking that he can manipulate the international situation to, 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 weigh, uh, to what he wants to see happen. So, um, if, if, if President Trump wants to tweet that he got a deal, he'll tweet he got a deal. And if he wants to say it was a success, he'll say it was a success. And if he wants to say, no, Mexico's gonna pay for the wall, he'll say Mexico's gonna pay for the wall. And if he wants to tell Prime Minister Trudeau, no, no, Canada has a trade surplus with the US, he'll, and maybe he'll tell Kim Jong-un, no, you don't actually have nuclear weapons, who knows? <laughs> um, which would be interesting, actually. That'd be a pretty devilish and diabolical way to approach this if you were advising President Trump. Um, what I'm getting at is, increasingly, uh, with this president, people don't necessarily expect things to be implemented. So if, if there is a summit, and if there is an agreement on denuclearizing the Korean Peninsula or other things, I'll turn to Nogami-san next, do you think that that would actually be implemented by people like Secretary of Defense Mattis or whoever is the Secretary of State? Well, it'd be Pompeo probably by then, or, or, or the National Security Advisor. Do you think, in other words, our, you know, our alliance exists in two democratic systems with checks and balances, with multiple people who have a voice. So even if the president makes some deal, do you think it will be implemented? And if it isn't, how much damage does that do? <clears throat> I'll come to you too. 
the uh, in a normal uh, you know, the uh, setup of government, I, I think uh, if a president decides, uh, the, uh, the the his uh, secretaries will have to follow. But uh, I don't know what the uh, the idiosyncrasy of a current uh, you know, situation here in Washington. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, the yes, uh, I think. Uh, uh, agreement between uh, Kim and uh, President Trump has to be really detailed and specific. But uh, is that uh, sort of detailed and specific agreement coming out from the summit? And uh, <clears throat> the, uh, there may be some sort of basic un meeting of mind between the two, but is that going to be followed up by the uh, the, uh, his or the, the Kim's uh, sin, uh, no, the bureaucracy, as well as from the U.S. bureaucracy. I, I, I don't think that sort of scenario is uh, possible because if that is moved to you know, the, the, the negotiation moves to that stage, uh, I think uh, North Korea is very, very good at the frustrating uh, and the whole thing. Uh, so, uh, I, uh, so you know, we are talking about impossible. You know, the detailed, specific agreements between the two leaders. That if that is not possible, can can they be followed up? Again, that is not very probable. So uh, I don't know uh, the uh, the dialogue. The word dialogue, like uh, motherhood and apple pie, you can't deny. You know, you can't criticize. You know, the uh, dialogue per se is a good thing, but what sort of dialogue is that? The, uh, and the dialogue, uh, for the sake of dialogue, you know, this is a, a cliche we have been using. Dialogue for the sake of dialogue uh, is uh, really a dangerous thing. Yeah, uh, I would say that, um, I think, Mike, your, your question, assumes that North, Korea's, North Korea wants an agreement. I think they just want, I mean, just talking with the U.S. president is a win in and of itself. Um, and, and, you know, it's been, it's part of the playbook, which is you drag out talks on non-nuclear issues or maybe talking about denuclearization of the entire world um, in, in such vague terms about hostile U.S. policy so that you keep dragging out negotiations. Um, so part of um, the, 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 one of the drivers for Kim's pursuit of nuclear weapons is prestige, and this is what talks do, um, is that, it, um, that he would not be plastered on the front pages of all the newspapers um, for going to the Olympics or um, having a summit with the U.S. president if he didn't have nuclear weapons. Um, and the fact that if there are talks and there are additional talks, you know, will Putin want to get in the game? Will she want to get in the game? It sets up a whole list of um, potential other summits for Kim um, and potential other um, public relations opportunities. Um, so I think, you know, I don't, I, I don't think Kim wants an agreement. I don't, I suspect that he doesn't um, anticipate that any agreement is going to stand. Um, I think um, that when, you know, North Korea thinks in terms of dynasties, we, t we talk in terms of, um, you know, every two or four years. Um, so I, I don't, I suspect that they don't see whatever agreement that they reach with this administration is going to last into the next administration with the new president. Um. The, uh, the, the, the dangers, I think, are uh, far outweigh the risks, and I agree with you all on that. I think, uh, as Kotani said, uh, as Kotani san said, just the President of the United States meeting with the North Korean leader um, is pretty stunning, um, particularly since it was North Korea's strategy for two decades to get the American president to do this, to demonstrate the efficacy of its nuclear weapons programs. So right there, no matter what happens, it's a big propaganda coup for the North. It disturbs me a little bit that we may have a situation where, Buck, uh, where Moon Jae-in, uh, Abe, and Trump all meet Kim Jong-un, but North Korea's ally, China, Xi Jinping, refuses to meet him because he finds him so reprehensible. <laughs> um, and I think that the, um, the, the I, I, I think Kotan san is right and nogami san are both right, that it's hard to imagine the US government, or even as, as Jung points out, the Korean, especially, imagine the North Korean government implementing an actual decision. 
but the symbolic damage could be considerable if, um, uh, even if that doesn't happen, uh, because it, it shows a cavalierness about how the United States, or at least the President, approaches the interests of allies, which is why this coordination will be so critical and why you will not see Shinzo Abe or many other world leaders or allies who are concerned say, don't do it, because they can't show any daylight. That would be really damaging. Let me open it up for some questions for the panel. I'd especially encourage the participants in our U.S.-Japan Security Seminar who are in town from prestigious institutions around the country and in Asia to ask questions uh, as well. Um, you've been very eager, so I'll let you start. <laughs> but please keep it brief. We have limited time. And please wait for a microphone. Thank you. Um, my name's Angelita. I'm, I also blog. My question is, uh, what I'm thinking, what provoked um, Kim Jong-un is he's probably between China and the U.S. Because from what I've read is that China's three largest military bases has just begun, become ready. And China is aggressively pursuing to be a regional and a global power in terms of the military. So I'm kind of thinking, well, maybe Kim is choosing between U.S. and, and China right now. So my question is, what does the panel think in terms of where is where would Japan Japan stand in terms of that? And then secondly, maybe a very radical thought is that would there be any possibility at all that we can recruit North Korea to be an ally of the U.S. In, 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 instead of being the bad guy for decades and decades? So the, those I'll are do my the questions. second one. The answer is no, <laughs> 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 unless my panelists disagree. Uh, but we like out of the box the question, so it's okay. Um, uh, the, the China question is an interesting one. We should say something about that. Nogami-san. Well, frankly, uh, there is no love lost between China and uh, North Korea. Kim Jong Un's Kim Jong Un's grandfather in 1938 was almost killed by Chinese Communist Party at that time. That's why he fled from uh, China to Russia, Soviet Union at that time. And, uh, and also, the, uh, uh, Kim, Kim Jong-un, the DPRK doesn't trust China. For instance, uh, the, uh, uh, the sudden normalization between the, uh, China and uh, ROK, you know, without understanding or any sort of approval or support from uh, DPRK. Yeah, so uh, I don't think, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, some people say that the China and the North Korea have this uh, you know, the relationship between lip and, the, you know, the, the, the teeth. But uh, nonetheless, I think uh, the, uh, uh, there's no love lost between the two countries. Uh, the, uh, uh, that, uh, the, and also, but at the same time, one thing uh, I'm slightly worried about is the uh, China and uh, the uh, Russia has already have already started this some sort of uh, you know campaign for easing sanctions. You know, let's not kill this constructive move created by this dialogue. You know, initiative for dialogue. You know what that means? Ease sanctions. Uh, you know, so, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, again, this is another trap, you know, the, uh, the, uh, uh, I have been talking about all these pessimistic things, but uh, the, uh, frankly, uh, the, lots of people are trying to sort of take advantage of this quote unquote uh, constructive atmosphere, you know, the, uh, this is a dangerous situation. Let me just add to that, um, uh, to Nogami-san's excellent point about how China and Russia, in particular, but also parts of the Blue House, are playing this to say, let's reduce pressure and sanctions and not ruin this wonderful moment. This is one of the consequences when the United States swings wildly between policies. I, I suspect a large part of the Blue House, the South Korean government's um, desperation to get this summit moving is because they were genuinely worried that the U.S. was considering preventive war. And so we, in my view, have pushed South Korea into uh, seeking uh, alternate paths 
rather desperately, that may not be so wise either. So cons consistency in foreign policy matters. Being an unpredictable president sounds good in theory. Being unpredictable with your adversaries in a negotiation is not necessarily bad, but when your power depends on alliances, unpredictability is terrible for alliances and alliance solidarity. That's, that's a fundamental international relations lesson that um, needs to be reinforced in the White House. Um, Korea, uh, Korean leaders um, end up on the ash heap of history when they are the shrimp caught between whales, when the larger powers intervene into Korean politics and tear them apart. Korean leaders who've been successful have played the big powers against each other. And Kim Il-sung was a successful, not a likable, but a successful leader because throughout the Cold War he played Moscow and Beijing against each other quite skillfully in the same way that, um, in the same way that, um, that Ho Chi Minh and the North Vietnamese did. And when the Cold War ended, I think the Kim Il-sung playback was to, book was to try to play the U.S. against China. Um, uh, but I don't think it will work ultimately to your second question because it requires the U.S. to accept uh, uh, a regime that we simply are not going to accept. We may say we do, but I, I, I just don't see it happening. Um, yeah, Michael. Uh, Mike Vesetic, PBS Online News Hour. Actually, following up on what you're saying, the South Korean foreign minister was here last week again, repeating what she and the president have been saying that we can't stand by and let our country be destroyed. I have not heard, correct me if I'm wrong, any similar statement from a leader in Japan that they fear an outcome of U.S. North Korean tensions would lead to the destruction of Japan. So does this difference in rhetoric uh, reflect a, a, a difference in policy that, and fear that may be unbridgeable uh, in, dealing, in terms of the United States dealing with these two allies? That is a really interesting question. Who wants to start? Japan has been exposed to this short-range and medium-range missile for decades. This is not a new thing for us. So, uh, you know, this, uh, this uh, uh, we have been a sort of front-line state for, for since the early 90s, uh, you know, the, uh, so, uh, uh, yes, uh, the, but nevertheless, uh, we, we somehow endured, and also we are now uh, are trying to beef up our missile defense system. So, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, no, this is, this is not the sort of newly created uh, threat or anything. It's, it's been there all the time. Thank you. Uh, I think we have this, um, this cocktail of threat perceptions. So um, the U.S. national security strategy says that North Korea seeks nuclear weapons to kill millions of Americans. Um, South Korea and Japan have been under this missile threat and nuclear threat for a while. Um, but, but we have widely varying degrees of threat perception by the U.S., which is much more heightened now as a result of the ICBM tests, um, uh, and South Korea, which is terrified about a, a preventive war, um, and um, Japan also. What, and I think that's why coordination, coordination, coordination. Um, if you have different threat perceptions, then how are your policy responses going to be anywhere close to what they should be, um, which is, you know, which, how, do we, how do we make it whole um, if the threat perceptions are so wildly different? So, um, so I think that's, that's a, something to do in, in a constant work in progress. It's an interesting question, Mike. I would just add two important differences between Japan and Korea right now. One is... Um, uh, Abe, at least for now, enjoys much more political uh, power and internal cohesion than Moon Jae-in does. Moon doesn't have a majority in the National Assembly. Um, even his Blue House, I think, is somewhat divided. Um, Abe has a pretty uh, cohesive, at least for now, it's changing day by day, a pretty cohesive control of the LDP. <laughs> um, and, um, and so uh, he's able to do what he's doing, um, and that is to... Um, uh, assert complete solidarity with the United States and show no daylight, uh, which he has to do because if he shows daylight, that invites China or North Korea to think they can drive a wedge between the U.S., but, and it also invites domestic political problems for a prime minister who got elected in part on his skill at alliance management. Um, so Abe is, I think, 
um, doing what in Japan is called soron sansei, kakuron hantai. He's agreeing with Donald Trump. Yes, I agreed with the military option, and now he agrees with the presidential summit option. But underneath the surface, his strategy is, and has always been, y y you stand by the US president publicly, you build your relationship, you call him a lot, because he, he does what the last guy told him, and then you use that trust to go in and explain all the reasons why a nuclear war with North Korea would be bad, <laughs> and to ask questions quietly. And, and Moon Jae-in is showing the differences much more publicly. I think that's more his style, but I also think it reflects the divisions within Korea that make it harder for him to manage. Um, both are threatened. Both are threatened. Both countries are threatened. Uh, but the way they handle us in North Korea is obviously different. Okay, yeah. Um, uh, yes, Jeff? Ree? <laughs> Thank you. Jeffrey Horning, Rand Corporation. Um, going off of what Mike just said with the question, how do, how do you think the political problems slash scandals in the US and Japan are going to affect the ability of the leaders to negotiate or at least just talk with North Korea? And then how do you think North Korea is going to handle both Japanese and American leaders knowing that maybe their political base is weakened somewhat? I'm not really sure whether this, uh, the, the Prime Minister and uh, the, uh, the LDP are facing some problems, but uh, I don't think it is uh, the, uh, uh, really uh, threatening the, uh, the future of this government. Uh, the reason is very simple. The Prime Minister's approval rate has slightly went down. But the party approval, generic party approval rate is fairly constant. If you add those two, not the political stability index, the, uh, it's fairly stable. Uh, and also, nobody wants to create a political crisis which may result in general election at this moment. Uh, the uh, people are Public opinion poll, yes, uh, you know, the, uh, the Abe-san has been in, in, in his position for a little bit longer than any other prime minister. So there is a, sort of you know, the uh, general fatigueness or fa fatigue. But all in all, party approval rate, generic party approval rate has not declined. And Opposition parties' generic approval rate has not gone up. So, uh, you know, the, uh, it's not going to be a sort of political crisis. Uh, the, uh, well, actually, government is facing a difficult, you know, management, but uh, the, uh, the, my personal guess, you know, I'm not representing anybody or any party, on, but I think a party will muddle through, government will muddle through. Uh, the uh, come spring when cherry blossom starts, it's it's going to be all right. I, I I'd say that Kim is looking at us and all the you know other democratic governments and saying, oh, thank God I'm not a dem democratic government. Um, and this is another reason why I you know I rule you know I use demotions and leadership shuffles and purges by anti-aircraft fire. Which government are you talking about? Right. Now? Right, <laughs> um, to to control my population. So, um, you know, he's outlasted the South Korean president. He's outlasted the U.S. president. He'll outlast a lot more. Um, I, I didn't recognize you because you have a fedora today instead of a cowboy hat, but uh, in the front here. <laughs> uh, my name is Mitsuo Nakai, uh, Reagan Foundation. Um, this is really complicated stuff here. We've thrown down uh, our last five yeah. minutes. Um, I agree with you. Um, uh, I don't think they're going to uh, give up uh, nuclear weapons uh, and so forth. Uh, Mike, uh, I keep thinking, what do they want? What does Kim want? That's the main thing that I think about. Uh, at the end of the Korean War, nothing was settled. No signing, no agreement, no nothing. So my thing is, 
do they want to settle that dispute, number one? Number two, uh, Kim has to bring something, a gift, back home from Finland, wherever they're going to meet. Uh, maybe thinking, I better do better than my dad. Because uh, Kim Jong-il met with uh, Madeleine Albright, uh, uh, Secretary of State for uh, Clinton administration. So is that what they you know, want to get? Uh, so those qu two questions. Uh, what do they want? Um, you know, I, I really hope that he doesn't want um, to finish what his grandfather started, right? You, reunification through force. But is reunification part of the um, through line here, part of the, of the longer term uh, objective? Because uh, decouple, you know, some of the American president decoupling, marginalizing of Japan, all of this would create the preconditions where um, Kim Jong Un could argue internally, I am opening up a path to unification under us that wasn't there before me. I mean, is that a motivator, you think? Um, I think it's one of the, I think it's, um, it's an aspiration. Um, I, I think we, you know, I'll be an optimist and say that we have human agency and that we can still shape his ambitions um, and to teach him lessons um, that will help him to reorient the way he thinks about um, nuclear weapons and about his, his place in the world. Um, so, you know, I think, but what, you know, I, I am worried about that this is an aspiration that he thinks is realistic. Well, you know, there's been a discussion, uh, what is uh, Kim Jong-un's real intention? You know, some people say it's a reunification uh, on its own term. Some people say it's just a re regime survival. But even if the, their ultimate goal is a regime survival, um, you know, they, are, they, they will request the withdrawal of the U.S. Uh, forces Korea. Then there will be a room or chance to reunify. So I think, you know, basically we have to uh, prepare uh, this, uh, uh, the, the nightmare scenario. Just to <clears throat> follow up on the, what the Kotarin-san said, uh, you know, if you take a look at, uh, you know, there, there are many experts here, but if you take a look at the force structure, uh, of the uh, U.S. force structure in Korean Peninsula and uh, in, uh, in Japan, Basically, all the uh, expeditionary factors, the forces are in Japan, and in, on Korean Peninsula, basically ground forces. And so the, the whole, you know, the U.S. presence has to be seen in total, Japan, the U Korea, and the United States. I hope uh, this uh, you know, the, uh, uh, would be also understood by some in ROK. The uh, ROK people do not necessarily want to recognize this. And also, funny thing is, the uh, Japanese government uh, has uh, the uh, status of forces agreement with the UN forces in Korea. The uh, six bases are available for US forces, uh, UN forces uh, under this uh, status of uh, forces agreement. And uh, I, I talked to many young Koreans, uh, they don't know this. The, uh, but uh, the, the security of the uh, you know, Asia-Pacific region, particularly in Northeast Asia, has to be seen in conjunction with this ROK, Japan, and the US forces. And uh, I think uh, this, I, I think Kim Jong-un wants to put some sort of wedge into this triangular structure. Thank you. Uh, I thought you were telling me to be quiet. You push the microphone, got it. Um, so I, we're going to end in a, in a moment uh, and go to our reception, and you can, you can uh, quiz uh, people on the stage and in the audience more on these issues. I think for, um, uh, for Kim Jong-un, he can go into this uh, with a variety of options, depending on how it goes. At a minimum, he might be able to buy time and, and sort of dissipate pressure, uh, as Nogami uh, Taishi said, by, uh, by, by building the narrative 
uh, in Beijing and, and Moscow and to some extent in Seoul that this is not the time to upset diplomacy. Um, and does he get anything concrete for that? Maybe not, but he, gets, he escapes what are now mounting sanctions, buys time uh, for the next round of testing. Remember, these missile and nuclear tests are not determined by diplomacy. They're determined by technical requirements and forensics after the tests, and then when they're ready to test, they have a window, and it's, it's, it is, it, despite the fact that almost all of us are foreign policy experts, the, the timing of these tests, I don't believe, was ever about foreign policy messaging. It was about developing weapons programs. Um, so uh, he may just buy himself time to the next test. He's, it's worked before. If he gets really lucky, he might get something on a peace treaty, because a peace treaty, or even uttering a peace treaty, even if it doesn't happen, starts to delegitimize um, the, the, the whole structure of U.S. bases, the Combined Forces Command in Korea, all of it flows from the Korean War. The U.S.-Japan alliance flows from the Korean War. Um, so de even just delegitimizing that uh, 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 could be to some advantage, even if he doesn't get a greater agreement. Um, the other piece we haven't talked about uh, fully, which we should, I'd like to end on, is the China dimension. Um, China's influence over North Korea potentially is enormous, as we know. Um, but this... Um, uh, assault uh, on the U.S. alliance structure through the nuclear coercion or through the diplomacy and, and an effort to sort of dissipate or de discredit alliance cooperation to slow down U.S., Japan, Korea, trilateral cooperation. All of this coincides with China's long-term strategic interests in seeing the U.S. alliance network weaken and not strengthen. So in some ways, North Korea policy is not that hard. You've heard coordination again and again. <clears throat> the core thing on North Korea policy is always make our alliances tighter, stronger, more interoperable, demonstrate to North Korea uh, that no wedge can be driven, that there are no seams operationally between U.S., Korea, U.S., Japan alliance that they can exploit militarily or diplomatically. Demonstrate to China the consequences of North Korea's action are that U.S. alliances are not only getting stronger bilaterally, they're trilateralizing. <clears throat> Ultimately, that large long-term game about the nature of order in East Asia, of our alliances, of China's role, is all caught up, in this, caught up in this North Korea thing. So we should do no harm to our interests in the long term, but also if we demonstrate with our allies a clear willpower to strengthen cooperation, that will put pressure on China, which does have a key role, but it's not gonna do what we want just because we're logical. We're gonna have to demonstrate we're gonna do what we have to do to defend ourselves. So um, we covered a lot of ground in an hour. Thank you uh, to uh, my fellow panelists who are outstanding. We have, I see food actually, so we have refreshments and, and food in the back if you want to continue the discussion. But for now, join me in thanking um, Dr. Park, Ambassador Nogami, and Kultani Sensei. Thank you.